All right, guys, so conservatives are still desperately trying to find the best line of attack to use against Tim Waltz, who was obviously recently selected to be Kamala Harris's VP for the 2024 election. Now, I've been keeping up with a lot of these attacks, and um, this may come across as a shock to you guys. This may sound outlandish or crazy, but I think that conservative pundits and politicians may have just slightly, just a tad, completely lost touch with reality. Okay, so here we have a, a compilation that was put together by The Recount on some of the latest narratives that conservatives are trying to use against Tim Waltz. Let's go ahead and jump into this. He's like a fat, bald, stupid Genghis Khan. Holy cow. This guy is hard, hard left. Certainly he has been a far left radical. This is a ticket that would want this country go, to go communist immediately, if not sooner. And I think it's very insulting to Jewish people. Walls, who has exhibited Marxist and almost Islamic behavior, he changed Minnesota's flag to look basically like a Somali flag. They're going to turn the entire Midwest into Mogadishu. So, so when exactly did conservatives just like stop bothering to use the dog whistles. Now they just come out and say it, right? He wants to turn the U.S. into Mogadishu. Not only that, but he somehow, through like a roundabout way, in the pocket of Somalia or Somalians, changing the Minnesota flag to look identical to the Somali flag. I don't know if you guys can like compare these two things. These don't even look similar to me. We'll get more into that here in a second. But not only does he want to change the Minnesota state flag or has successfully done so, right? Not only is he trying to turn the U.S. into Mogadishu, but he's also a Marxist. He's also an Islamist. And according to Donald Trump, he wants to turn this country into a socialist hellscape immediately, if not sooner. What's sooner than immediately? I don't know. You guys tell me, right? These are just some of the talking points. We'll continue the video. Specifically on this flag, I got to get this out of the way. Minnesota had a process that basically had nothing to do with Tim Waltz. Their previous flag that they had in place had some pretty overtly, I would say, racist undertones to it with Native Americans and white settlers on the flag. So they decided, let's change it. Let's update it, right? Let's revamp it. And you had this entire process that played out where people made submissions and then those submissions were voted on and inevitably they settled on like sort of a combination of a couple of different people's submissions and they ended up with this. And the narrative from conservatives, I guess, is that like, what? Tim Waltz is in the pocket of the Somalian government? Is that what we're saying? Are we saying that because the Minnesota population happens to be like 1% or so Somalian? that he's like just serving those people and not the rest of his constituents and he's like forcing through this flag change as some sort of like a deep conspiracy like what what exactly is the narrative that they're trying to push there i genuinely can't even understand it but they changed the flag to this this star is apparently supposed to represent that minnesota i guess is called like the north star state and then these colors are supposed to represent like the the sea or the 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 sky or whatever the fuck it's like this is just a generic state flag. What are we doing? What are we doing? No, it has to be some deep conspiracy about Tim Waltz being in the pocket of Somalians, right? Guys, again, they've completely lost the plot, but here we go. They continue. It somehow gets worse from there. Mogadishu, someone who took 30 trips to China and, and took students with him so they could be exposed to communist propaganda. When were you ever in war? What was this weapon that you carried into war given that you abandoned your unit right before they went to Iraq? What bothers me about Tim Waltz is the stolen valor garbage. He went AWOL on his own unit. But, but previously- okay. abandoned his troops. Oh, I think a Harris Wall. We already covered all of the military stuff in my live stream I did recently when we were covering what Jesse Ventura said about it. But guys, this is somebody who served in the military for 20 years. He was in the National Guard for over two decades. And then because he chose to retire, which you can do after 20 years of service, because he chose to retire and then after, after he made that decision, his National Guard group that he was with ended up deploying, then somehow he's like a traitor to the nation. That's sort of the narrative that they're trying to sell. I mean, it's just ridiculous, especially when, guys, I mean, J.D. Vance is making that argument. You are on the ticket with Donald Trump, a guy who had like fake doctor's notes about bone spurs so that he could dodge the draft. 
Like you're going to attack your opponent on 20 years plus of service in the military. That's going to be an effective attack when you're running under the ticket of Donald J. Trump. Who the fuck are we kidding, guys? Now, on the earlier point with, with Tom Cotton and uh, Tim Waltz spending some time in China, guys, that's one of the most based aspects of Tim Waltz. Yes, he spent some time in China. You know what he came back with? I saw a recent podcast where he was talking about it. You know what he said? He said, I don't think that the United States and China need to be mortal enemies with each other. That's basically what he said, right? That we don't have to continue with this escalatory path towards like World War III with China. Oh, isn't that terrifying? Isn't that terrifying that we, we could have some sort of like a mutual cooperation to the benefit of both countries with the United States and China? Isn't that terrifying? But no, people like Tom Cotton need to insist that because China is the big, scary, communist baddies, we have to escalate to war with them. I mean, it's just insanity. But they continue here. Alt's uh, ticket is uh, make America burn again. People would love to mind their own damn business if you, asshole, hadn't let rioters burn down those businesses. People were reported for doing things like playing basketball in their yard during COVID. I saw my wife and I gave her a big hug and a kiss because I love my wife and I think that's what a normal person does. Tim Waltz gave his wife a nice firm Midwestern handshake. She has her little security blanket. Tampon Tim. Waltz will let doctors cut your kids' balls off while looters burn down your house. He's a freak in sheep's clothing. Okay. He wants to cut your kids' genitals off while rioters burn down your community. Guys, what are we doing here? What are we doing here? I've covered a number of different times the policies. I'll remind you of them here in a second that Tim Waltz managed to get through in Minnesota and some of the things that he did before he was the governor back when he was a, a House member. But I just like, I wish that we lived in a world where or a country where we could actually have conversations about real substantive issues, policies. But instead, we live in a world where conservatives are talking about cutting kids' genitals off and how Tim Waltz desperately wants rioters to burn down your city, and how he's a traitor to the country. The fuck are we doing? We also had Donald Trump here, who said this. This is a short little clip here. Let's just listen. And you're not going to be allowed. You're all going to be thrown into a communist system. It's a communist system. You're going to be thrown into a system where everybody gets health care. You're going to be thrown into a communist system, a communist system in which everybody gets health care. Am I, am I supposed to be freaking out about that? First off, neither Tim Waltz, nor Kamala Harris, nor any elected Democrat is a communist. They're not. Conservatives don't know what the word communist means, or they're lying about it. It's just typical red scare, bullshit, fear-mongering. But you're fear-mongering on the idea of everybody getting health care. Is this the argument that you want to have? Guys, Kamala Harris, we'll get to this in a minute. She's not even in favor of universal health care. She's not in favor of Medicare for all. She ditched that all the way back in like 2019, 2020. But you are choosing to attack her, not on like your strongest issues, like, I don't know, the border, for example, but you're choosing to attack her on the idea of universal health care, that it should be terrifying that Americans wouldn't be going bankrupt due to medical bills. Okay, good luck with that, I guess. Now, again, some of the policies that Tim Waltz managed to get done. Many of these with a one a one seat majority in Minnesota. Hear from Jeremy Slevin to start us off. Universal school meals for kids, stronger labor protections, cannabis legalization, stronger LGBTQ protections, paid leave and sick leave, 100% clean energy by 2030, reproductive rights, $1 billion for housing, gun safety laws, cut child poverty by one third. Other policies. He opposed the Wall Street bailouts. In 2008, he voted against outsourcing deals. He has a 100% rating from Planned Parenthood. He banned non-compete clauses. He raised minimum wage for small businesses. He raised taxes on multinational corporations. He protected gender-affirming care. He banned medical providers from withholding care over debt. He protected construction workers from wage theft, and he passed a massive Minnesota infrastructure bill. He also, by the way, opposed the Iraq war. He also opposed U.S. intervention in Syria. He also, by the way, signed on to the Yemen War Powers Resolution to try to end the Saudi-led and U.S.-backed genocide in Yemen. 
Guys, I'm not like a cheerleader for the Kamala Waltz ticket. I live in Washington, D.C. I'm most likely going to end up voting for Jill Stein. Um, but the idea that like you could look at what we just looked at and and have massive criticisms for this guy, this is the best that you could possibly ask for from a top Democrat in one of these positions. Like this is by far and away the best of any Democratic governor around the entire country. And again, he did most of this with a one-seat majority in Minnesota. Who else has this kind of fucking record? But there's a reason why they're attacking him, not on his record, not on specific policy proposals. They're just vaguely throwing out buzzwords to try to get people riled up. He's an Islamist. He's a communist. He wants to cut your kids' dick and balls off, I guess. I mean, it's just, it's lazy. It's lazy. Now, just as a reminder, in terms of where the polling is currently at, this is a data for progress slash Bernie Sanders poll that just recently came out here again from Jeremy Slevin on the popularity of a left wing agenda. Guys, this is where Democrats should want to be. They should want to be in a position where they are supporting policies like this and force Republicans to attack them right? Force Republicans into a position where they are attacking you for providing breakfast and lunch for school children. Force them into a position where they are attacking you for supporting abortion rights, right? Use your strongest issues, progressive policies, and then force that to be the landscape by which you are having a debate with conservatives. That should be the goal of the Democratic Party. So here's the latest polling data. I want you guys to focus on this number over here, the net positive on all of these policies. Expanding Medicare to cover dental, vision, and hearing. This is a Bernie proposal. Plus 74. 84% support, 10% oppose. Plus 74. Guys, there's almost no policy in the entire fucking country that has plus 74 as a rating for it. Expanding Medicare has that rating. Another one, cut the cost of prescription drugs in half by making sure that Americans pay no more than what they pay in Europe or in Canada. That's plus 73 make the wealthy and large corporations pay their fair share on taxes 69 expanding social security benefits by making the wealthy pay the same tax rate as the working class plus 62 which by the way this also solves this you know hysteria problem from conservatives about how social security is going to go bankrupt all you have to do to prevent social security from going bankrupt is to lift to the cap Right, right now there's a cap. I don't know if it's like $150 or $200,000 and above that point, you no longer have to pay into Social Security. You remove that cap, make the wealthy proportionately pay their fair share, and Social Security is funded. And there's no need to worry about it going bankrupt or you know cutting benefits or anything like that. But again, that proposal plus 62. Institute a cap on rent increases plus 57. Reestablishing the child tax credit, plus 50. Build at least 2 million uh, units of affordable housing, plus 51. Raise the minimum wage to $17 an hour, not 15, $17 an hour, plus 44. Cap the amount of money that families spend on child care at 7% of their income, plus 47. Eliminating all medical debt, plus 38. Establishing a Medicare for all single payer health care system, plus 37. Plus 37, 63% support, 26% oppose. Make public colleges and universities tuition-free, plus 25, and passing the PRO Act, plus 31. So, to a large extent, this is just like the Bernie Sanders agenda. The same agenda that Republicans and Democrats have been fear-mongering about for the last decade, ever since Bernie was making it to the upper echelons of U.S. politics and was a serious threat to potentially become the president. This is all the same shit they were, they were fear-mongering about. All of this is overwhelmingly popular. What does this tell Democrats? It tells Democrats lean into a populist left-wing economic messaging and you will win, right? This should not be a shock to anybody. Should not be a shock. We also have, in terms of foreign policy, Democrats and independents were asked if they were more or less likely to vote for Kamala Harris if she pledges to withhold more weapons to Israel. In Pennsylvania, 34%, this is Democrats and independents, said they were more likely to vote for Kamala if she stopped sending weapons to Israel. 34% more likely, 7% less likely. That's in Pennsylvania, guys. In Georgia, 39% more likely, 5% less likely. Arizona, 35% more likely, 5% less likely. So in other words, this polling data definitively shows, definitively shows 
that withholding weapons from Israel as they continue with their genocide in Gaza is good politics and good policy, right? It's good policy in the sense that the weapons we're sending them are already illegal under U.S. law and under international law, but it's also good policy. It's also good politics in the sense that the overwhelming majority of the American people want an immediate, lasting ceasefire. The overwhelming majority of the American people want you to cut off weapons to Israel. It is contrary to popular belief. This may be shocking to some mainstream pundits, but contrary to popular belief, ending the weapons sales to Israel is popular amongst the American people by wide margins. By wide margins. In all of these key swing states, Kamala Harris just needs to come out. It's not as if, like, you know, standing beside Israel and affirming your Zionism or affirming the right for Israel to defend itself. And, oh, maybe I'm going to waffle on the fact that I think too many civilians have died, right? That is not popular politics. That's going to divide your base. It's going to piss a bunch of people off. It's not going to benefit you in these swing states. But this will, by wide margins, this will benefit you. Pledge to cut off weapons to Israel. So there you go. We also move on. Because this may give an indication in terms of why some Republicans are a little bit um, a little bit nervous right now in terms of where this race is going. So this is from the Cook Political Report. And their new survey has shown this. Biden versus Trump and then Harris versus Trump. So this is comparing late July to early August, right? Or this is in late July slash early August. So after Biden drops out, this is what happens. There was a shift in Arizona to the Democrats plus eight. In Georgia, to the Democrats plus four. In Michigan, to the Democrats plus five. In Nevada, to the Democrats plus three. North Carolina plus 10. Pennsylvania plus eight. Wisconsin plus five. It is genuinely kind of amazing how much just like not having an obvious senile semi-corpse at the head of your ticket could do for the Democratic Party overall. Like these numbers are insane. These numbers are mind-blowing. A like in some cases plus 5 to plus 10 shift in swing states just by replacing Kamala with for Biden. I mean it's not as if like their their you know ideology or their policy agenda is like radically different. The only difference is Biden's age, really. It's his cognitive abilities, and it's it's some of his recent record, right? But just having a new face in there, even somebody who is the vice president under the extremely unpopular current president, even that was enough to flip this race on a dime. Like this is a complete one eighty from just a month ago. It's absolutely insane. This is what the numbers are showing. Plus four, plus five, plus eight, plus 10, shift in the Democrat direction. Now, in terms of Kamala's latest policy, and then I'll finish off this video, we have here from Jeff Stein. Now, keep in mind, Kamala has not revealed her actual policy agenda yet. Like there's there's still at this point, as far as I'm aware, nothing on her website about an actual policy agenda, which is kind of pathetic. It's even more pathetic that Joe Biden got to this point you know, a couple months out from the election, he still didn't have a real policy agenda laid out for the American people on what they were going to be voting for outside of voting against Trump. Kamala carrying on in that tradition. Apparently, she's going to have something out soon on her economic policy. So here's just one of those things. Kamala Harris will, on Friday, propose the first ever, ever federal ban on corporate price gouging in the food and grocery industries. The campaign says in a statement, we'll also announce measures on housing and prescrip prescription drugs. So depending on what the details of this are, depending on, you know, what this policy actually says, these will be good things to focus on, you know, leaning into the idea that, yeah, OK, fine. Under the Biden administration, we've made some positive steps. We did. We passed this Inflation Reduction Act and whatever else. But, you know, there's still a lot of work to be done. That's good messaging, you know. Leaning into the corporate price gouging aspect of inflation, great messaging. Definitely continue to do that. And then, you know, if you're going to expand affordable housing, if you're going to continue to expand the ability for Medicare to negotiate on prescription drug prices, those are also positive things, right? So this is the kind of shit Kamala should be leaning into, right? On the flip side, 
We also have things like this. Again, no surprise here, but the Harris campaign says there will be no push for Medicare for all. And um, this is, of course, coming from the same people who tweeted out this picture uh, just a couple years ago. Biden tweeted this out, him and Kamala. You believe POV, you believe healthcare should be a right, not a privilege. So this is basically them just like swiping the Bernie Sanders line from 2020 when he said healthcare should be a right, not a privilege. They literally just stole that word for word when they don't actually support that through legislation. But so there you have it, guys. I mean, there are some positives. There are some negatives. Overall, Kamala is kind of running a smart campaign right now, right? She picked Tim Waltz. He was definitely the best out of the options that were on the table. It seems like they're leaning into somewhat of a slightly more left-wing economic um, agenda. You got a guy like Tim Waltz, again, who can actually make the case for labor rights, for abortion rights, for child care, things like that, you know, because he actually has a track record of doing that in Minnesota. So, I mean, that's good stuff. I, I don't think that, you know, the idea that Kamala Harris is not you know, doing many interviews right now. And she's not, you know, doing any sort of like contentious public appearances. She's just kind of going around to swing states and doing rallies right now. I don't know, maybe, maybe that's a smart move to just sort of avoid awkward situations to avoid, you know, difficult situations. Maybe you can just grind it out for the next couple of months and swing yourself a victory in November. I don't know. You guys tell me, but you know, it's, it's, it's definitely an interesting situation because, Again, from a left-wing perspective, I could come up with critiques for Kamala Harris. I could come up with some critiques around the edges for somebody like Tim Waltz. But conservatives, man, it's like you put in somewhat of a more center-left or left lefty guy in as the vice president. You look at his track record on policy, and it's like they have no idea what to do. They're calling him Tampon Tim. They're calling him Genghis Khan, a fat, bald, stupid Genghis Khan. They're calling him a Marxist and Islamist. It's like, you guys are stretching because it seems like you got pretty much nothing at this point. Politic guy has the best politic. Believe me, no one does it like him. Believe me. Everyone is saying, 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 saying.